John chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at 3 through 6 today. And I want to say this is probably one of the most serious messages I'll ever preach. I don't expect it to go long, but I do expect it to be serious because it deals with some very serious issues, biblical issues, faith issues, and salvation issues. So especially verse 3, it says, And hereby do we know that we know him. The title of this sermon is, We Know That We Know. I know that I know him. If we keep his commandments. So there's the text of this sermon. Hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. First John 5.13 says, These things have I written unto you, that you might know that you have eternal life, and that you might believe in the name of the Son of God. But you'll never know that you know unless you keep his commandments. I couldn't possibly know that I'm saved if I didn't keep his commandments. In this particular case, he's not talking about the Jewish law. He's talking about the moral law, the Ten Commandments, of course. You can tell that by looking at the third chapter, verse 4 of the same book. But hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 says, The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal the Lord knows. Isn't that nice? Amen. Thank the Lord knows them that are his. Amen. He's not confused like you might be. He doesn't conflate the gospel like some people do. The foundation is settled. It's sealed. He knows. There's nothing hid from the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So the foundation has been settled. It's sealed. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. This is simply the doctrine of the Bible. I didn't make this up. This is the Bible. This is what God says about the matter. In Matthew chapter 7, it gives you three subgroups of people who are not going to make it. So one person who says, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? That's the first subgroup. The Laodicean preachers who tell lies about the gospel, and conflate the gospel, and say a little bit of sin is normal. Have I not prophesied in thy name? The second group is, and in thy name Cast out devils. Well, I know that's a dispensational truth, so that must be either the apostles or that's the Pentecostals. I'm not trying to be ugly to Pentecostals, but that's a sign gift, not a gift of the Spirit, to cast out devils. But that's what they're going to say. Have I not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. There's many religions like Islam and Catholicism and other religions. Christians ought to be the ones doing the wonderful works, but it seems like everybody else is doing the wonderful works. The Mormons are doing a marvelous job of uh, rallying people into their false gospel. Have we not done many wonderful works? And then he'll declare unto you, Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Now, in case you don't know what that word is, you can look it up. I think you know what it means. It's a licentious life. It's a hidden life. It's a double life. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. If you have two faces for Christianity, it's not real. There's only one face of Christianity, and that's holiness. I never knew you, he said. There was never an intimate bond betwixt us because you went after iniquity. So that's the three subgroups. Hereby do we know that we know him. We know that we know. I know that I'm saved. How? How could I possibly know? Have you ever sinned and felt guilty? Have you ever felt condemned because you sinned? Because it was so vile? Because it was so dirty that you couldn't but think that maybe I'm not saved? Well, maybe you're not saved. Maybe you are. If you are, you're going into... Hebrews chapter 12. If you're not, you're going to be deceived and just keep on sinning. Finney once said, 
People who come under gospel preaching this strong, if they don't repent immediately, will be hardened to the core. So that the next message will just harden you more until you're iced over and you will not be able to repent. Like Esau, who sought repentance with tears but could not find it. That's what it says in the Bible. How do you know you're saved? If we keep his commandments, it says. How do you know you're married? You don't commit adultery on your wife or adultery on your husband. That's how you know you're married. Because that's the condition whereby somebody can divorce you. That's how I know I'm married. I love Bettina. Therefore, I don't sin against Miss Bettina. I don't commit adultery not even with my eyes. I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not think upon a maid. That means when I see a maid, I don't think upon her, which is adultery in your very heart. It's not just a light thing. It's adultery and adulterers will die. Go read Leviticus 18 and 20 respectively and you'll find out what I'm saying is true. And you can also go to Galatians 5 and you can go to 1 Corinthians 6. It says fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God. How much clearer can this be? Why the hearts of men wax gross? Why are they iced over with sin and think that they can just pretend that they're Christians? The foundation of God standeth sure the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I'm going to divert from this message for a minute and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, please. I saw something this morning that interested me, and I think I should bring this out. Verse 8 is talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where fornication was commonly reported in the first century church. It's common in the first century church. This is the 21st century. Do you think it's not common to have fornication, eye adultery? Licentious living, double lives, it's commonly reported, it says in 1 Corinthians 5. And this verse right here in verse 8 is talking about just that. He's talking about the young man who had inappropriate relationships with his stepmother. And then Paul wrote the letter to tell him how to remedy the problem. And here's what he says about it. For though I made you sorry... With a letter. That was the letter in 1 Corinthians 5. He made them sorry. They were sorry about it, all right? They felt bad. They had a worldly sorrow. They responded. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Paul said, what I told you I meant in the full force of it. And I say the same thing today. How do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments? If a man say, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, he's a bold-faced liar. How do you like that? That's what it says right there in verse 4 of 1 John 2. Yes. If any man say, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, he's a liar. You might say, you're of your father, the devil, John 8, 44 says. In the lust of your father you will do. Well, no wonder you can't stop. The lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and bode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he's a liar. He's a liar. He may have lied to you to say that it's okay to sin a little bit. He's the father of lies. So back in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, I do not repent and I do not repent of this message. I hope it's so hard that it breaks your icy heart. It cracks it open once and for all so that you'll fall down and repent at once. And then know that you're saved at once. I don't repent. He says, I do not repent. Though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, but it was for a season. Now there's the icebreaker of this message he preached to them it did some good they were sorry but it was just a seasonal sorriness you understand what it's saying seasonal 
just for a couple weeks or a couple months or maybe six months or whatever it might be. It was just a season. They didn't understand what real repentance was. Therefore, they didn't repent. They thought it was saying, I'm sorry to God. They thought it was to quote out some eloquent prayer of salvation, like some magic wand or some magic words. There is no magic words. I'll tell you what the magic words are in the Bible. If you want to call them magic, I don't believe in magic. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then go and sin no more. That's the magic Amen. words. If you want to call it that. It was a season. It didn't stick. It was just for a little while. Anon with joy, they receive it. But then afterwards, it says in the 13th chapter of Matthew, afterwards, the devil took that seed out of your heart. Though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry. Not that you had tears like Esau. Who cares if you had tears? Was it real? Amen. Doesn't matter if you were sorry in the past. Are you sorry now? I can tell you something. I still weep over my past sins from time to time. When I just think about them, I'll never go back. Never. Amen. As far as I'm concerned, if I do, well then, okay. I'll have to get on my face for seven days like David did. And then say, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Although I don't think he'll take the Holy Spirit from you. You never had it in the first place is the problem. Now I rejoice. Verse 9. Not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. There it is. You need to sorrow to full repentance. You say, I don't know what repentance is. Isn't it just saying I'm sorry and shed a few tears and Go bow down at the cross and tell Jesus, I love you. We do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. The reform necessary is to keep his commandments. You say you're preaching legalism. You say you're preaching works-based salvation. Well, that's the object of my message today, to prove to you this is not a works-based salvation. Amen. This is salvation full and free. He that sinneth is the servant or slave of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son of God abideth forever. If the Son therefore shall make you free from sin, you shall be free indeed. There it is. I'll never tell you that before the cross, before you're saved, and all of your tears and sorrow, that you need to do the Ten Commandments to get saved. Never! Never, never, never. It'll never save you. You can do the 613 of the Jewish laws. You can get circumcised. You can get baptized. You can take the Lord's Supper. You can do whatever you want to do. It won't save you. So don't tell me it's a works-based salvation. It's not. Pre-cross, there's nothing you can do but repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glorious gospel. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So there it is. We know that we know him because we keep his commandments. Adam knew Eve and she conceived. It was an intimate knowledge, not sexual. Intimate knowledge. I know him. I know him. And he knows me. After the cross, it reminds me of getting married to Bettina, you know, after the cross, after the wedding. I know that I know her because I keep the seventh commandment. I know that I know her because I keep the sixth commandment concerning her. I know that I know her because I keep the ninth commandment, which means I don't commit adultery. I don't steal from her and I don't lie to her and I don't do anything inappropriate to her. That's how I know that I know her. And that's how I know she knows me. After the cross. Back to the text in 2 Corinthians. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, 
For you were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us and nothing. The damage that he's talking about, go read 1 Corinthians 5. You'll see what the damage is. They took the person who was in sin and the church disciplined them. And they said, was such an one known not to eat? And that means the Lord's Supper. Was such an one known not to eat? They're not a Christian. And so if they're doing it unworthily, well then... They drink and eat damnation to themselves, not discerning the Lord's body, the body that came down out of heaven and went onto that cross and died for them. And the blood ran down and it made atonement for your sin. So that's the damage. With such an one, know not to eat. If they're not real, don't eat with them. So he's saying, I don't want to have damage. In this message either, although there was no former because it was but for a season. It wasn't real. Maybe he scared them, but it didn't last. And they got hardened. Verse 9, Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. Listen very carefully, please. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Did you get that? Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. How do you know you're saved? Because I keep his commandments. That must be godly sorrow. It must be not a seasonal sorrow. It must be an enduring sorrow. A sorrow that changes your outlook about sin itself. Paul said it was exceeding sinful after he saw the law. And the things of the law, exceeding sinful. So godly sorrow worketh salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's a godly sorrow, which is to salvation, and there's a sorrow that leads unto death. That's what he says right here. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. What does he mean by that? You repent and then you don't repent of your repentance. Isn't that simple? I stop looking at girls and lusting and then I don't repent of that. I just keep not lusting. It's not hard. Make a covenant with your eyes. Let your eyes look right on and your idlers look straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world. That works death. It's a sorrow that doesn't change anything in your heart. It's a sorrow that just makes you feel a little more comfortable because you've got a little religion. Maybe you've got some juggling of theology in your head. You're trying to figure out, well, did I do it right? Did I say the right words? Do I need to do such and such things differently? Say it again. Bow down again. Do something else again. It has nothing to do with the words. It has everything to do with what you do with your life. Amen. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Not to be repented of. How do I know I'm saved? I don't repent of my repentance. I don't say one thing and do another. His letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, such will be in deed when we are absent. In other words, I'm going to practice what I preach. And that's what you ought to do. Right. Sorrow of the world work at death. Godly sorrow work at repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Is this clear? Is it a works-based salvation? Prove me wrong. I dare you. If this is works-based salvation, you ought not to say in the church. I wouldn't say in a church that preaches works-based salvation. Would you? No. I tell you again, at the cross of Calvary, before you're saved, there's nothing you can do in terms of morality or good works or baptisms or circumcision. Nothing you can do. You pass from death unto life, from the power of Satan unto God, and you receive forgiveness of sins at that instant at the cross of Calvary. Amen. After that, I'm married to Jesus Christ. And why would I wreck my marriage by 
committing lustful sins, any kind of sin whatsoever. In case you don't know what real repentance is, I'll just tell you what the text says about it. Verse 11, For the, behold, the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness. I'm not going to go through all these in extremity, but you know what it means when you're careful. Some of you just go right into the same old mire, the same old hog pen, thinking that it's going to be all right. You can go into the same entertainment and the same movies and the same everything, and you're not careful about anything. And then you say, I wonder why I fell. I wonder why I slipped again. I'll tell you why you're not careful about your life. Real repentance, if it be true, if God really came down and died for you, if you've really been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you would be careful. What carefulness it wrought in you? Yea, what clearing of yourselves? Yea, what indignation? Don't you ever get fed up with sin? Doesn't it make you mad ever? Sure, you could fall. Sure, you could have a bad thought. Sure, all this stuff. Don't you just sometimes stamp your feet and say, that's enough. I'm not going back ever. I've got an indignation about sin. This is true repentance. It's not some light thing. Sin is not some little mistake. My wife says a mistake is a black sock and a white sock or a black sock and a blue sock. That's a mistake. Sin is not a mistake. Sin is sin. And sin has a consequence. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What indignation. Yea, what fear. Some of you don't fear God. Some of you think it's a joke, or you think it's theology, juggling theology. Well, what about this verse, and what about that verse? Doesn't this verse say that we can, and doesn't that verse say that we can't? Go ahead and juggle your theology. It says real repentance has fear of sin. How do you know that you know? Because you keep his commandments, that's how you know. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what zeal. You know what happened to a young man? Potiphar's wife eased herself in. Oh, wasn't she sweet and illicit and immodest? She said, lie with me or just be by me. Don't lie with me. Just come over here and sit down. Just sit here right next to me. I won't touch you, you liar. What do you think he did? Did he said, okay, well, I won't lie with you, but I'll come and sit next to you. That's what some of you all do. Right. You don't lie with a real woman, but you lie in your mind. You're a liar, just like your father, the devil's a liar. Am I being strong? I want this to be clear. Amen. You know what he did? He had a zeal, holy zeal. He left his garment and he ran out. Amen. The last verse in this book of 1 John says, Dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Amen. Anything that keeps you away from God, flee from it. Amen. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Listen, if you came to the prayer meeting, you know what vehement desire is. When you just look up in heaven and say, I just want more of you, God. Amen. I couldn't care less about sin anymore. I want God now. I have a vehement desire. My soul pants. I follow hard after God and his right hand upholds me. My heart and my flesh crieth out after God. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you don't, there's something wrong with you. Because real repentance gives you a vehement desire. A strong desire that you can't even hardly hold back. Amen. I know what it's like. I got married to my beautiful wife. Just look at her. I mean, how could you not be enraptured by Jesus Christ? Huh? How could you not? You must not have eyes to see. You must be blinded by the devil or something. Right. Real repentance is vehement desire. Yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. All right, just hold your place there and just turn over one page. And look what it says here in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. Casting down imaginations, verse 5. Amen. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought. Every thought. Amen. You know what your problem is? Your thinking processes are wrong. You're thinking about women when you ought to be thinking about God. Amen. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness, verse 6, to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 
Well, if your obedience is not fulfilled, it doesn't apply to you. The Bible says real repentance says revenge. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. Someday I'm going to have my foot on his neck. And that day is today. Uh, sin has no more dominion over me. Right. I'm free from sin by the grace of God. Sure, Amen. I could sin. It's not impossible for me to sin, but it's possible for me not to sin. Therefore, I choose not to every single day, That's every right. single minute. I'm not anticipating, well, maybe in two weeks no. or two months or six months. Nonsense. Amen. There's a revenge. That old devil, he had you tied up for a long time. Why don't you revenge him? Why don't you make this the day that you turn from all sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ the right way and have true repentance? Amen. Amen. What revenge in all things, in all things, brother, all things you've made yourselves clear in this matter. And the matter was fornication. That's the matter today, isn't it? Isn't that the grand matter of this generation? Fornication! Yes. YouTube adultery. Call it what you want to call it. I adultery, fornication, pornography, whatever you want to call it. It's disgusting. Amen. Real repentance says, I'm clear of all of it. Right. I'll kick the face out of the computer. I'll crush my cell phone with a sledgehammer if I need to. Amen. Let me tell you something. This little thing doesn't do anything. This is a good piece of equipment. Until you start messing with it and letting the devil come into your mind through this. Right. It hasn't come into this one. This one's purified, it's sanctified by the grace of God. Amen. But is yours sanctified? Is your life clean? Or do you think this is the problem? Well, if it is, get rid of it. Amen. But the problem is your heart. That's the problem. That's real repentance. That's right. yes. Back in the text, 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, He that saith, I know him. And keepeth not his commandments is a liar. Is that clear? Yes. I mean, that's exceedingly clear. You say, I know him, but you're a liar. How do we know you're a liar? Because you don't keep his commandments. That's how we know you're a liar. And if I know you're a liar, certainly God can see down to the, the purposes of your heart. The thoughts and intents of your heart. He knows everything about you. You think you're going to skate through this life sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting? Go look at Jeremiah 6. It says, I'm weary. This is God. I'm weary with repenting. It wears them out. Sure, you could do it. Maybe you'll make it. But here's what it says. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth of this Bible is not in him. There you go. How are you going to argue that theology? You're going to try to prove me wrong? You're going to say I'm preaching works-based salvation? What are you going to do with this message? I'll tell you, repent. I tell you, do it now before your heart gets iced over like crystals. Before you get harder than a rock. Before you Go so far that you can't come back. Before God turns you over to a reprobate mind, you might even still keep coming to the church and paying your tithes and all the stuff. But he says here, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. Now there it is. Your daddy is the devil. If you commit sin, I'm talking about commission, committing sin. David calls it the presumptuous sin. It's the great transgression. Just go read Psalm 19. You'll memorize it this week, I hope. Or just go read the end of the chapter. Presumptuous sin is the only sin that has no remedy, period. You say you're a Christian, but you sin, you're of the devil, period. If we sin willfully, after that we have known the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful, looking for of judgment and a fiery indignation. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose you, shall be thought worthy, who have trodden underfoot this book right here, the gospel of grace, and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith you were sanctified an unholy thing, 
and it done despite under the spirit of grace. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we're baptized into a resurrection life. Within the veil, his spirit deeply anchored, thou walkest come above a world of strife. Within the veil, thy soul with him united shall live on earth his resurrection life. That's real salvation, brothers and sisters. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Did you hear that? The real purpose of your salvation is to crush the tempter's power in your life, to give you full and free salvation so that you never go back. We do know that we know him if we keep his commandments.